test with this microphone. I forgot to do it. Good morning again, 1045. <laughs> Good to see you today. We're blessed. We're blessed. And we're blessed. And because of that, we have a responsibility. I'm going to be sharing a passage of scripture with you this morning and I'm going to do it a little different than I did the first service. I'm going to read this whole passage before we start. How many of you know what it means to willfully forget? You know, if, if you try to remember something, what do you do? You write it down, put it in your phone. Uh, I saw Bob Walker just the other night. He, he was writing notes and wrote down some names and different things because he, he wanted to remember those things. And uh, if Bob Walker needs to write them down to remember them, I know I do because he knows everything. But, uh, uh, but if we want to remember something, we, we'll make note of it. We'll try to you know, write it down, put an alarm in our phone, tell somebody smarter than us to remind us, you know, all those kinds of things. And we're going to be looking at some willfully forgetting this morning. Uh, I told this story in the first service, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell it again uh, about a friend of mine who was slated to help with the men's breakfast yesterday morning. And I'm not going to call his name. I almost did mention his wife's name in the first service. But I'm not going to call his name because most of you will know who he is. But he was going to help cook breakfast yesterday morning, and, and we meet at 6 to do that, and then... He came into the office on Thursday and he said, um, my wife tells me that I promised to go to the beach on Saturday. And he said, I don't remember the conversation. Willfully forgetting. Um, they probably did have that conversation. He admitted that. Maybe they didn't, but probably they did. You know, I've had some of those conversations and my wife will tell you that I'm just wasn't listening or zoned out or just willfully forgot the conversation. But anyhow, he calls me and or comes to the office. He tells me that. And then uh, he said, but I'm going to be there. I'm going to help with the breakfast. And then we're going to go to the beach. I said, okay. I said, but if you need to go, go ahead. I understand we'll have plenty of help. No, I'm going to be there. Friday night about 8.30, he sends me a text uh, we've decided to go on to the beach early because I'm sure that's what that original conversation was. And uh, he said, so I won't be able to make the breakfast. And I said, no problem, we're fine. But uh, I'm sure they had had that conversation and he willfully forgot. Because most of the time when we do that, men... It's because it's not a priority. It's not nearly as important as it was to the one who initiated the conversation. So we willfully forget. But I want to read you this passage of Scripture this morning, and it talks about some folks who willfully forget the promise that Jesus had made when he left the earth after his crucifixion, when he was ascended into heaven, and he told the disciples, I will come again. And this had only been... 30, 35 years since he had done that, and, and here's the that leads us into this passage of scripture from 2 Peter chapter 3. And this is this is the second time that Peter had written to them about this matter. But listen to what the word of God says. Beloved, I now write to you, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3, 2 Peter. I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. We need those reminders from time to time that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, and here's where we're going to spend some time in 
this next couple of verses. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And then I want to drop on down to verse uh, 14. Therefore, beloved, look forward to these things. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. We tend to forget. But I want to assure you today that the promise that Peter's talking about here in 2 Peter chapter 3 is a promise that will happen. They've asked the question, where's the promise of his coming? There's going to be scoffers. Uh, Peter warns of those scoffers. We hear about it often. If you were around during the 80s, and, and most of us were around during the 80s, at least to some level, some of you were just maybe just barely on the scene, and maybe it's before your time, but if you were around during the 80s, there was a lot of talk about the, the second coming of Christ and the end of the world and all those kinds of things. And, and I, I read an article this past week uh, that William Martin wrote, in, in the early 1980s, he was a freelance journalist. He wrote an article called Waiting for the End. The article was published in the June edition of Atlantic Monthly. And on the front of that article was a man dressed in a blue suit with a Bible in his hand depicting a preacher. Now, you know, when I went to college, this tells you a little bit about what we had when I was in college. When you wanted to find something like that, an article, you got this little card. And you went to this big machine, and you plugged that card into that machine, and you moved the, the light around on the card, and you looked in, and, you know, you could sometimes it was fairly clear, and other times it was pretty blurry. But those machines would, would let you read that little micro card, and there was all kinds of information on it, nothing like a chip on a computer now. But we would look at those cards and, you know, have to read these articles and different things. But I found this one right on the Internet of all places. And sure enough, there's this front of this article in June of 1982, I think it was. It says, waiting for the end. And here's this little blue man dressed in a, or man dressed in a blue suit, had a Bible in his hand. And in the backdrop, there was a, a like a city line. It was a... Like New York City, you would see the, the buildings and or Atlantic, Atlanta, one of those larger cities, and you would see the, the buildings. And, and then behind that, there was a big wall of water. And I'm thinking, if, if you really knew about the end time, you would have a ball of fire back there instead of a wall of water. But they were just fulfilling prophecy. They were scoffing. They were making fun of these people who believed that the end was coming. And they were scoffing. They were just helping to fulfill the promise or the prophecy uh, of that there would be scoffers in the last day by just basically making fun of those who were asking the question or, or making a statement that Jesus is coming again. And they were waiting for the end and, and scoffing and making fun of. So this morning, I want us to look at that promise and then make some application to that promise about what we as Christians should be doing in light of the promise that Jesus indeed is coming again. He's coming. And we say, well, the early church believed that. Well, Peter said the early church believed that. They thought when Jesus said he's going to go away and come again that he would be right back. But verse 8 kind of gives us a little bit of an idea of why that hasn't happened. But I want us to see this morning, the first of all, that the promise is part of the plan. It's part of the plan. I'll try to keep up with my notes this morning because the monitors are not working, but that's also where my clock is. So if I get to going along, the lights start flashing off and on, that means I've got five minutes. That's what 
Garrett said he was going to do. But, but God didn't just wake up sometime in the last few thousand years and, and decide that, oh, I'm going to have to bring an end to this thing. These people I've created, they've just gone nuts. You know, he, he knew all that was going to happen in the beginning. He knew that you and I would fail before the beginning of time when he decided to create the heavens and the earth, when, when God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were in, in, that's all there was before the beginning of anything else. He decided, God decided that I'm going to create some human beings to have a relationship with. Now, I'm not God, and most of you realize that, um, and I don't comprehend what God thinks or puts together, and I, that's a good thing because my mind is pretty limited. But if I, if I were going to create something, I would probably create something that I thought would at least work. But God knew all along that we would fail in this relationship. He knew that it would cost him the very best that he had, his son Jesus Christ. But he decided in his infinite wisdom to create us anyway. But in that creation, he not only created us because he wanted to have a relationship with us and he loved us that much, but he also loved us enough to give us the free will to choose whether or not we would respond to that love. We have the ability to either accept or reject that promise. But not only was it part of the plan, but it's not delayed, but is right on time. Look at what Peter says here. He says, do not forget this one thing. It's as though Peter was saying, hey, listen, this is important. You want to scoff and ask me about the end time, but listen to this. Listen to this. Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So if, if you took that as a literal time scale, it only been a couple of days. It's now only been a couple of days. But that's not what Peter was meaning at all. He didn't give that so we would have some prophetic formula and there are those who do that and that's why they guess it when Christ is going to return and they're always wrong. But he says, he's, he's communicating a general principle regarding how we see time and how God sees time. You see, we're limited in our scope of time. We can only live in the present, this moment. We can't live in the past. We can't live in the future. And the moment that I just told you about is now in the past. I'm now living in a new moment. We're we're bound by that scope of time. We can think about the past and we can dream about the future, but we have no ability to live in anywhere except right in the present. And our present leads us into the future. Listen to what John Phillips said in his commentary. God can savor a day as though it were a thousand years. God is not locked into time sequence as we are, he can summon all of time before him, past, present, and future. In other words, he can pull all that together and look at it in one picture. A moment at a time or all of the moments at once. And Peter apparently introduces the subject as a counterbalance to human impatience. We look at our calendars and accuse God of being too slow. God looks at his calendar and sees that he is right on time. Many of us have experienced God being right on time. We get impatient, and then God comes through, and we look at the things that have happened. We were looking at the past, and we had the ability to see that, yes, God was right on time. And God is not, pay, or God is not delayed even in his second coming. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon says. All things are equally near and present to his view. The distance of a thousand years before the occurrence of an event is no more to him than would be the interval of a day. With God, indeed, there is neither past, present, nor future. He takes for his name, I am. He is, I am. I am in the present, I am in the past, and I am in the future. 
Just as we say of God that he is everywhere, so we may say of him that he is always. He is everywhere in space. He is everywhere in time. The truth is that God will keep his promise and God will return and come again as he said he would. But not only is the promise part of the plan and it's not delayed, but is right on time. But in that promise, we see God's patience revealed. God's patience revealed. He's not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long-suffering. Why? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I think about a young man that we saw baptized on Mother's Day. That basically the rest of society had given up on him simply because of his lifestyle and, and some of the things that he had done and the way he portrayed himself. But his mother didn't give up. For about 10 years, she prayed for him to come to know Christ. And when you think about that, if God was not patient, what if God had came return back to earth in December, where would that young man be? Think about all the people even last week that maybe listened to an evangelistic message and came to know Christ. And if God had not been patient, where would they be? But when we think about the Lord returning, and many times we think about that selfishly because we get tired of what we're living through and we become impatient and God is so patient. And his greatest display was at Calvary. But now he waits again, day after day, year after year, century after century. Why? So that men, women, boys, and girls have the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ and respond and come to repentance. Listen to what he says in Ezekiel thirty-three eleven. 11. The Lord is speaking. He says, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? So if God is patient and we have a message to share, then what's our responsibility? It's a promise, I think this is next in your notes. It's a promise that must be preached, proclaimed, told, because hell is a real place where real people, some of which we know and therefore bear responsibility, will spend eternity unless they hear, believe, and obey the gospel that has been entrusted to followers of Christ. That's you and me to share. Listen to what Romans chapter 10 says. We'll begin in verse 13, a very familiar verse to most of us. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But what many of us don't realize is that that puts that responsibility on you and me to share the gospel. Because verse 14 says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And that word pe preacher there doesn't mean just Pastor Harold or Pastor David or whomever may be preaching the gospel. But that word preacher there means every one of us, one who would tell or one who would herald, one who would, would scream out and, and share the gospel. But who do we tell? Who do we tell? The Bible's full of examples of who Jesus and others shared Christ. Number one there is the wealthy. Remember the story of the rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked him, said, good teacher and Jesus said why do you call me good there's none good but God he says you know the commandments he lists the commandments and the rich young ruler says well all those things I've done and Jesus said 
looked back at him and he loved him. And he said to him, one thing you have lacked. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. Come and take up your cross and follow me. And the young ruler's response was this. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. That doesn't mean they were great. He just means he had a lot of them and they were great to him. But he chose to take what he had, depending on what he had and maybe what he could give and what he could do with it, rather than having a relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to, we need to reach out to the wealthy. doesn't mean everybody's going to respond. Jesus himself shared the good news with this young ruler, and guess what happened? He rejected. So not everyone's going to respond positively. The next one I'm going to skip and come back to, people who are different than us. We also need to reach out to the sick and oppressed. You think about the sick and oppressed, many of those folks can't come into a church service like this. So, so what does that mean? We have to go out to them. When you think about the, the, the stories that you read, and I'm not going to read them for the sake of time, in Mark chapter 1, verse 32 through chapter 3, verse 12, Jesus had just preached in the synagogue, and then he goes out. Great example for us. We're listening to the, to the word this morning. We're being challenged i've been challenged over the last couple of weeks as i've prepared about my witness and when i hear the word and i have a responsibility to respond just like jesus preached in the synagogue and then he went out he went out to meet who the sick and oppressed those who were uh, demon possessed and ill in their homes and he went out to meet those people not just to heal their illnesses but to share with them the good news that there's more to life than just life And he reaches out to all of those, and you can go and look at those, but we need to reach out to those who can't come in, the sick and oppressed. The next one, we need, we need to reach out to the religious leaders, or the, the, to the religious. Nicodemus was a religious leader of his day. He was one of the 70 elders on the court known as the Sanhedrin, which was the highest religious body among the Jews. We have a lot of religious people today. They're just religious. They don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They live a good life. They do good moral things. They give to good causes. They worship something. They're just religious people. We need to reach out to those folks. We have a, a, a large culture in our society today that, that believes just because I've been in church all my life, I must be a Christian. Because I haven't murdered or raped or committed adultery or I, I honor my father and my mother and I've done all these good things. So evidently I must be a Christian. They think that they can progressively make their way into heaven. It's called progressive salvation. That's not true. Sanctification is progressive. Salvation is a one-time event in your life when you, when you kneel before the, the Father and you say, Lord, I've sinned and I accept your payment as as." as done through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and, and I give my life to you, and to the best of my ability, I'm going to follow you. There has to be a point in your life when you commit yourself to Christ. And your conversation with God may be totally different than that. But you're committing your heart and your life to him. That's a one-time thing. You can be very religious and still die and go to hell. We need to reach out to our enemies. Think of the Paul, the... Saul Paul's story in, in Acts chapter 9. Please go back and read that later. It says in verse 1 that Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Why would God reach out to Saul? Of all people. He was committed to killing the, Christian, the early Christians of the day. But God reached out to Saul and said, there's a man I can use. And one day in your life, God looked down and said, there's a man or a woman or a boy or a girl that I could use. And he convicted your heart and you responded to the good news. And we have a responsibility with that good news that we share to reach out to those around us. And I want to go back now to the, to the one that I skipped. And I have a reason for doing that. People who are different than us. People who are different than us. You know, it's... It's one thing for me to, to look around and see people that are 
dress like me, look like me, do the same things that I do, enjoy the same things that I enjoy, and, and I think may fit into my mold and get involved with them, build a relationship with them. But it's a totally different thing for me to get to know somebody that appears to be different than I am. Whether it be race, social status, just the way they look, or whatever that might be. It's another thing to reach out to someone different than me. Look at what Jesus did. He went to the well, Jacob's well. It says Jesus was weary. You, you can go back and read the story later in John chapter 4. It says that Jesus was weary from his journey, and he sat down by the well. And of all people, there was a Samaritan woman that came to draw water. If you know anything about the history of the day and even the story there, the, the, the woman says, why are you having anything to say? But Jews don't affiliate with Samaritans, especially Samaritan women. The Jewish man is not supposed to talk to a Samaritan woman. And Jesus told her, I have water that if you'll drink, you'll never thirst again. He basically shared the good news that he was the Messiah. He was the Christ. And you can go back and read that. But Jesus reached out to those that were different than him. And the list could go on and on and on. And basically it includes the next blank in your notes. It, it includes everyone. It includes everyone. We're not to be an inclusive group. Or an exclusive group. We're supposed to be inclusive. To include everyone. I saw a clip it's been some time back, and I've, I've listened to it several, several times. And I'm going to play it again this morning for your hearing. And I have listened to it many, many times. This mic one. Hello. Yes, it is. All right. I want you to listen to this. This is, this is Jack Cunningham, and I don't know a lot about Jack Cunningham. He's not from the same denomination, but he gives this testimony as he's preaching a sermon one day, and I want you to listen to this, and it really fits where I was and maybe to some extent still am. I struggle with this. I went to get a haircut. My barber in St. Louis, it's very rare that I can get a haircut at the same place twice. I know I need one now. Don't look too close. But when I get a chance to go to my barber in St. Louis, it's a treat. I've had my hair cut in some of the most horrible places you can imagine on earth. Brother Kelly and Sister Kelly, I went and got one in Scotland when I was there. And the guy got to talking about Margaret Thatcher, and I thought he liked her and talked, found out he hated her guts. But the more I talked about her, the more he cut. I called my barber, said, can you get me in? They said, yeah, come this afternoon. I went to the barber shop, so, so happy and pleased. I was going to get a good haircut from a barber I trust. And when it came time for my appointment, the, the receptionist come out and said, Mr. Cunningham, I'm, I'm sorry, but your barber had to leave on an emergency. He's not here today, but, but Julie can cut your hair if you want her to. And I thought, well, I'm here. I need a haircut. Julie will be just fine. About two minutes later, a girl stepped around the petition. She had hair that was sticking straight up in spikes some of it was purple some of it was blue some of it was yellow some of it was orange that girl must have had a hundred piercings in her face all around her ears her lips her nose I mean in, her, in the sides of her eyes she was all pierced up and under the piercing was all kind of painting she had on polka dot pants and a plaid shirt she had on two different color socks and her shoes didn't match She said, I'm Julie. Are you Jack? <laughs> if it wasn't for wanting to please God, I'd have said, no, ma'am. Jack said, tell you he had to leave.
And I thought, well, I'll just endure it. And I went and sat down and I did like I do too often. I thought I'll just go to sleep. I'll just sit down here and close my eyes and rest while this girl cuts my hair and I hope she hurries up. There couldn't be anything in the world her and I would have in common. There couldn't be anything on earth she and I'd want to talk about. She wouldn't want to hear anything I got to say. I certainly don't want to hear anything she's got to say. I apologize, but that's what was going through my mind. While she's cutting my hair, she said, where do you work? I said, well, I, I work over here at the World Evangelism Center. Go to the end of I-70 and right where it butts into 270, that big building right there. And she said, oh, yeah, I was there the other day. I said, you were at World Evangelism Center the other day. She said, yeah, you have a bookstore in there, don't you? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, my mama is a cocaine addict. My uncle is a hopeless cocaine addict. She said, somebody gave my mama one of those videos on Left Behind. And, and, and she said, we all sit down in the living room and watched it. And she said, I don't know nothing about God. And I don't know nothing about the church. And I don't know nothing about the Bible. But she said, when I was finished watching it, I knew I didn't want to go to hell. She said, I went to your bookstore and bought a Bible. She said, I don't know how else to find out anything about God. She said, I just bought a Bible and I'm going to start reading it through. She said, I've had it two days now. I've already read. And she named some books that she had been reading from. But she said, I really don't understand anything about it. And when I looked in the mirror, tears are streaming down her face. The other people that are cutting hair have quit cutting hair. And now they're listening to her talk. And some of them got tears in their eyes. And when I got up out of that chair, I said, Julie. I want to apologize to you for not telling you about Jesus. I said, but if you'll stay here, I'm going to go to my office and get a Bible study. And me and you is going to sit out there on that park bench. And I'm going to give you a Bible study and help you know about Jesus. We don't have a right to determine who can hear and who can't. Don't boil or fry another egg before this happens. Did you get that? We don't have a right. I've watched that clip. I've listened to it. I don't know how many times, a dozen at least. More than that probably. Because I'm guilty. Looking at someone and saying, ah, they, they, they don't want to hear. We don't have a right. Jesus tells us to go into all the world. Listen to what Mark 14 or 16, 15 says. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to part of the creation. No, it says the whole creation. We don't have a right to determine who gets to hear. And who doesn't? Our responsibility is to everyone. So I'm going to challenge you today. Who is in your sphere of the everyone? You see, I'm convinced that one plus one equals two. And if every one of us would reach one person for Christ in the next year, we'd have twice as many people. But it's evident that we're not faithful. Because you would think in a year's time, if we were diligent about sharing the gospel, that we could reach one person in a year's time. I want to give you a couple of examples of my sharing the gospel. Because I don't have the right to determine who hears. The first church I served in, a lady came to me. She was an elderly lady. She said, my brother's dying. He's in the hospital. He's in intensive care. She said, will you go 
share with him. And I said, sure. And not knowing the whole situation, and I walk into the intensive care unit, and he's behind this plastic screen, and I didn't really know why, other than they allowed me to go in, and, and I stood beside of his bed, and he's thrashing about. Just They've got him strapped to the bed. He's, he's just all over the place, screaming at the top of his lungs. If you've ever been into an intensive care unit, they're, they're pretty cool places. They've got the temperature cranked down. And he's screaming at the top of his lungs, get me out of here, it's hot. And he's just thrashing in the bed. And I stood there for several minutes and the nurse said, you're not gonna be able to talk to him. He's been doing this for hours. I'm convinced that that man saw into his future and saw eternity what lay ahead. And unless God gave him another opportunity of some sort, he split hell wide open because people around him procrastinated about sharing the gospel. Maybe he would have accepted, maybe he would not. But I've asked myself this question several times. Why did his sister, his own sister, wait until it was... He couldn't comprehend what I was saying and I couldn't hardly understand him other than he was screaming, it's hot, it's hot. I've never seen that before and I've never seen it since. But that was one of the most eerie feelings I ever had in my life. Somebody screaming at the top of the lungs, get me out of here, get me out of here. The other one I want to share with you is about a man that a lady in that same church came to me and she said, will you go share with this gentleman? He's in a hospital and it was about a two hour drive away. And I said, sure, I'll go. But then she had to tell me something that I wished I had not known before I went. She said, he's a very rough man. He's not been receptive to the gospel. The people that's tried to share with him, he just turns them off. She said, he's a very big guy and he may physically throw you out of the hospital room. I said, well, you didn't have to tell me that. You know, I'm a little guy. I don't want to get thrown out of a hospital room. So I'm thinking of all these excuses of why I can't go visit this man at the hospital. Even after I committed to going and I'm driving down the road and I'm like, I don't have time. I got this to do. I've got that to do. And the more I tried to talk myself out of it, the more I was convinced and convicted that I needed to go. And I got to the hospital and I walked into that room and I, I remember it forever, I guess. It, it's a picture that's etched in my mind. And when I walked into the door, I could see straight into his room and he's sitting in a chair in front of the window. Great big guy. Hair just stringed down, just rough looking. Great big beard and I'm thinking, well, here's where I'm going to get kicked out. But I walked up to him and I, I introduced myself and I said, someone's asked me to come and see you. And he just looked up and he said, well, what do you want? And I thought, here it goes. She just, she told me the truth. I'm getting ready to get kicked out of here. And I said, well, and I called him by name and I called her by name. And I said, she's asked me to come and share with you because she's concerned about where you will spend eternity to be, determining the prognosis that you've got, gotten from the doctor. You don't have long to live. And he said, that's right. I said, she's concerned that where you will spend eternity. And she, come and asked, she asked me to come and share with you today. He dropped his head. The next time he looked up, big tears just screaming down his face. God broke his heart. And I was able to share the good news of Jesus with him and he accepted Christ and uh, it was not but a few days later that he passed away. Nothing I did but be obedient. Share the good news. Folks, we have a responsibility because of the promise that Jesus is coming back again. There are going to be men and women, boys and girls in our sphere of influence that we're responsible for sharing the good news that are going to split hell wide open. And whether they accept it or not, it's not up to us. I want to finish right here because there is nothing, absolutely nothing more important in your life right now than making sure you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior.
There is nothing, nothing, nothing more important in your life than knowing for sure that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Matthew 28, 18, we've called it the, the Great Commission. And we've, we basically have put fear in people's hearts about sharing because we call it the Great Commission. And we put emphasis on that great, and it is a great commission. But it really is a very simple commission. I read a little book entitled The Simplicity of Disciple Making and Seven Ways We've Complicated It. Small book, I read an hour and a half. Rob Fisher, the author of that book, says this, by complicating what's simple, we've inadvertently stifled what we strive for. We say that we're an evangelistic church and we want to share the gospel, but we've complicated sharing the gospel, so we've stifled what we strive for. And we've done that to ourselves. Because really, when it gets down to it, Sharing the good news of Jesus comes down to three basic things. Going. Matthew 28, verse 19 starts out like this, go. And really, a lot, and like a lot of other areas of our English language, we've done a very poor job of translating the original Greek there. The original Greek there is a present tense participle. Participles normally end in ing. Present tense means that I'm actually doing it presently. It's something that I'm engaged in. Really, it should say, as you are going, would be a better translation. So the assumption there is, by Jesus himself, is that we're going to be going in our journey of life. We're going to be living life. We're going to be going about. We're going to be meeting people. So it comes down to three simple things. We're going to be going... And we're going to live our life in front of people in such a way that they're going to eventually look at us and say, there's something different about you. But the sad thing about it is, the church today is not much different than the world. We use the same language, we go to the same places, we do the same things that they do. There's no different in our life. And the only time that we live like Christians is on Sunday morning when we're gathered like this. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday is a whole different picture. And we're totally different people. So when those people are around us during the week at work or school, they have no idea that we go to church on Sunday. Because we're living our life just like they're living. And there's nothing different to attract them to what we have. So we need to be living our life in such a way, if you go back to Second Peter chapter 3, I'm going to get there real quick. Verse 11 of that passage says this, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? We need to be living our life in such a way that it attracts people to Christ. At some point in time in that relationship, we're building relationship with people and they ask the question, what's different about you? Or there'll be opportunities that we'll be able to share our faith. We need to live our story out in front of them and then eventually we need to tell them our story. We have to open up our mouth. The Bible says that, 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 that the hearing comes from the word. i get back to my passage again. We have a responsibility to share the good news with those around us. In church, we're failing. I'm failing. You say, well, what do you say? You just share with them, all of us have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, including me. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that while we were yet sinners, God loved us enough to die for us. You see, I paraphrased three passages already right there in three sentences. It doesn't take long to tell them the good news. And Romans 10, chapter 9 and 10 says, if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes 
With, for with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, verse 13. It really is that simple. And we've complicated it so much. It's just a heart relationship with the God who loves us. Revelation 3.20 is a great follow-up verse there. It says, Jesus himself is speaking and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and him with me. God is knocking on your heart this morning. You have nothing more important in your life than to know for sure that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can do that by simply believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead and then confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. It really is that simple. But as Christians, we have a responsibility because one day, Jesus will come back again. And for those who have not yet received him, it will be eternally too late. So my challenge today is, are we living our life in such a way that it attracts people to Christ? Or are we just like those around us that have no relationship? That doesn't mean we're not going to mess up. It doesn't mean that we're always going to get it right. But I'll promise you one thing. Read that passage of Scripture on the back of your notes. If we'll commit ourselves to doing that, God will do abundantly above all that we ever can even think or ask. And he'll give us the ability to share our faith. Where are you today? Do you know for sure that Christ is Lord of your life? If not, I'd love to share that with you. Make sure you get that one thing right. And I know there's others here will as well. And are you sharing your faith? I mean, are you just simply just living your life as a Christian ought to live in a world around you that's lost. Dying and going to hell. And many of them will never listen to the good news of the gospel because they've seen you and me live a life that's no different than theirs. That's been very convicting to me this week and last week as I prepared. I'm guilty, just like everybody else. But where, what will you do from this point? We see time has past, present, and future. We can't do anything about the past. We can learn from it. But in the present, we can make a commitment to do it differently in the future. So that's what I'm challenging with today. And I pray that God will work in your heart. Whatever God's asking you to do, would you come as we get ready to sing? I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll do that. Lord, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for how it convicts, how it convinces, how it molds and shapes us. And Lord, as we've heard your word today, God, I pray that we'll respond in a way that would bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, for someone here that has never made that commitment, Lord, or is unsure about the relationship with you, God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, for those who have committed to Christ, Lord, what are we doing to make sure those around us have a right to hear? God, we don't have the right to choose who hears the gospel. Lord, might, might we change the way we think as we share the good news, the way we live our life. Lord, that you would live through us and give, this, give us the ability to share the good news of Jesus so that those around us would hear the good news and respond. God, help us today to be more faithful. In your name that we pray. Amen.